Oh, oh this yeah. is confusing. Okay. All right. Am I on now or is there a break? Yes, or... go ahead. Oh, okay. Hello, everyone. Um, thanks for being here. Thanks, Ham Fan, for organizing this. Um, so my topic to do with string tensions and break angles hasn't, um, speaking from a maker's point of view, hasn't really been of much interest to me through most of my career. I think I've always done normal dimensions for saddle height and overstand and archings and bridge, which are what um, determine break angle. Certainly, if I do a higher arching, I don't do a lower bridge. So I imagine my break angle varies somewhat. Um, strings, of course, um, the players in the end determine that. And most players play medium strings. So when I built lightweight instruments and tried to use lighter strings because they have some imagined advantage, straight, the players don't usually like them <laughs> because they have a very different feel. So in the end, I think we're constrained in terms of string tension by the player's choice, but we do have some control over break angle, but it's worth understanding, I think both of these a little better, at least for me to try and understand that there's been a lot of, um, not a lot, there's been conversations on chat sites and in occasional articles about the importance of these things. Um, sometimes to my mind, they're exaggerated importance, but I don't know, I haven't studied it. I'm, I'm starting a bit now. The, the emphasis is this on my talk is preliminary investigation. I'm not trying to answer the question so much as sort of look at the territory and do a few measurements. And um, hopefully at Oberlin, it would be a great sort of project to work on because then we could not just do measurements, but do um, testing with players and, and, and things like that. So um, here we go. Let me share my screen. Um, I want to go into. Okay. Um, does everyone see my Good. pointer? Okay. Yep. Oh, okay. Pointer. No, point of it. Pointer? Uh, is the mouse, does the mouse show up? Yes. Okay, just so I know. So, um, of course, string angles determine the overall amount of tension on the instrument, and break angle determines um, how much of that goes down on the on the top or through the bridge. Let's look at string tension first. Um, um, fans been over this, but I just wanted to get a sense of um, what is normal. Um, oops. And I think a normal tension is about 23 kilograms, or shall I say an average looking at what's available there. The dominant, these are violin strings tend to be a little lower. They have a porosity a little higher. Pi is, is somewhere near normal. Um, and that would be about 23 kilograms or 50 pounds. So I'll just say, well, that's the number I have in mind for all the rest of the talk. Um, so what are the effects of varying string tension? The most obvious one is to do with uh, the interaction of the player and the string. And I think that's um, the, absolutely the dominant one. It also affects um, static behavior, such as the deformation of the instrument, how much the instrument flexes when we tense up the strings and how much it creeps in the long run. I would hope to talk some more about that in this talk, but I'm, that's gonna have to come um, in, a, in part two of this um, sometime down the line. And so the question I had today is how much does, how much is the acoustical behavior affected um, by the string tension? Um, um, how much is the modal behavior? So um, physicists are always proposing simple models to help us understand it. Um, I certainly thought, I'm not a physicist, but to try and think of some things which which I can understand better than a violin because they're they're less complex in in some obvious ways, and um, in this case, an, a bow such as an archery bow, it has a string and it's it it, it bends a, a beam and the beam gets um, tenser. Now I think we have a. Well, I should speak for myself. My intuitive sense about when systems get tensed up is they get somehow brighter. Um, do they get louder or do they get muted by that? I don't know, but certainly we'd expect their frequencies to go up. If you, if you bend a ruler and tap it when it's straight, tap it when it's bent, you know, you'll hear a higher pitch. Um, 
So clearly the tighter we tight, tighten the string, the more the bow gets bent and you'll have the um, inside axis of it compressed, the outside stretched, and that creates restoring force, which increases with bending. So the frequencies will go up. Um, so that kind of, to me, rhymes with our intuitive sense of what um, adding tension does, at least to some systems. Is the violin like that? That's the, point. That's the question. So it happens that with an archery bow, the lowest um, bending mode frequency rises a factor of three or four when, when strung up. So that's an enormous change in frequency. Now, in many ways, uh, an archery bow is, or a bow is um, the opposite of a violin. The string is not really stretching at all. The bow itself is bending a lot. With the violin, of course, the string is stretching and hopefully the violin isn't moving very much. It must move some amount, but not very much. Therefore, I would suppose that the effects of increasing string tension on frequency are going to be small, but in the upward direction. Um, there was a very nice paper by Rod Cross, you can, you can download it for free, um, of why bows get, um, um, I can't read my own title because of, let's see if I get this, no, it won't, just a moment. Okay, um, anyway, you can all see the title. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's a very um, interesting paper. And um, um, experiments conducted by the author indicate that the mode frequency of a violin frame increased by less than 1% when the string tension is increased from zero to normal tension. He doesn't give details about the experiments, but I assume he's talking to some sort of um, B0 mode or B0 like mode where the whole violin is bending like a beam, in which the case it makes sense for the frequencies going up. Um, or does it? We also have the, the bridge pressing down, maybe that has a, you know, a countermanding effect. Um, so I've tried to imagine an instrument which would be very strongly um, affected by string tension. So imagine a kind of a, a, a bow um, with a, a, um, a scroll and fingerboard on it so you could stop the string and a, a pickup and a loudspeaker so you can make some sound and, and imagine trying to bow this. Clearly, if you put higher tension strings on it, this, the beam will bend more and we will get um, higher um, increased frequency of the um, modes and presumably a brighter sound. So um, again, that notion of the sound um, getting brighter or at least the resonant frequencies going up, excuse me, is, is kind of affirmed by this, this model. Um, now, if we look at the, the bridge itself, now actually a comment um, Jim Woodhouse made once about how the downward force of the string increases the rocking frequency is, is one of the things that got me interested in looking at this sort of thing. Um, the downward force of the strings on the bridge compresses effectively the strings in the, the waist. So um, that would tend to increase the rocking frequency, um, but also you're, you're also adding strings which add mass to it. So I think the net, the net effect of putting a um, um, heavier strings is to reduce the rocking frequency. Um, I mean, Jim can probably um, clear that up. Um, but it's reasonable to expect a change in string tension to affect the rocking frequency of the bridge somewhat. And as Jim was pointing out, that can have effects on the very important um, formants of the violin. So let's look at a completely different type of, of a model. This is a beam that is under compression. Now, if you have a, a vertical beam, Jim did a great demonstration. You put a ruler on the table, you press down on the top, and eventually it buckles. So what happens to the, to the bending frequency of the beam when you compress it? You have the stiffness of the beam, which provides reforming, restoring force, but if the beam can bend to one side or the other, it relieves the tension downward. And so you get a, um, um, you get a, a, a contrary force, which pulls the frequency down. So the more compression on the beam, the lower the frequency goes until the beam buckles. Now, in, in sort of an ideal system where there's sort of a hinge at either end, the, um, the frequency would go all the way down to zero because it would be, um, there'd be 
um, at that point, there'd be no restoring force. And so any, any gust of wind or vibration would immediately buckle it. Now, um, I thought I would, you know, just to get a feel for that, how, how, how this sort of compressing thing um, wor works out with the sort of materials we use. So I got a little base bar stock and put it in the vise. And um, I started gradually tightening the vise and with a little iPhone app, FFT, great app to have around, measured the frequency. So it started off at 868 hertz. So I screwed a little 851, a little more 848, a bit more 844. And then it started to go up. And if you look at it sideways, the beam was starting to curve. Now, so that sort of shows how that sort of thing works in the kind of materials and dimensions we're using. Why doesn't it get anywhere near zero? Well, it's not at all a hinge system and there's a lot of other things going on. Um, but that's something I found useful to plug into my head as sort of a balance to the notion that adding tension necessarily increases frequencies at all. So in select cases can decrease frequencies. Um, it happens with a tennis racket, which has an enormous amount of tension, so like 62 pounds or 28 kilo kilograms for each string. So that's more than the entire tension on a violin for each string. And um, so when the frame of a, a tennis racket is, is, is tightened up, the, 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 the um, fundamental frequency of the frame decreases by about 10%. And that's again from Rod Cross. So let's look at a violin, a side view where we have um, tension downward. Um, does the lowest out of plane mode go down in frequency? I try, I, it's hard to do this without a proper rig. I, I did it by tapping and I have the impression it does. I would like to do a proper experiment to show that. Um, but we certainly see buckling behavior and that is surely um, enhanced by um, the downward, um, by that kind of buckle frequency notion. Um, we also have the strings compressing the top plate and we have top plates um, um, deforming um, in, in kind of have that kind of buckling. And of course that's, that's greatly aided by the bridge, but it makes me think we shouldn't necessarily assume that tension is gonna put the mode frequencies up or down on the violin. It, when, when we really need, um, uh, um, uh, I think a FEA model to determine exactly what's gonna happen. And I hope some of the people who are doing that will, will look at this question. It would be great to have some some firm answers, um, but otherwise we're 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 left with with measuring. Um, okay, this is one of George Stepani's animations. So we, we we could say that increasing the compression force will decrease frequency of modes where the vibration causes cyclical decrease in length of body. We can say the converse that um, if it um, causes cyclical increase, then it will it will. Um, it will do the opposite. So um, just another um, set of um, um, conditions which affect how static forces might affect acoustical behavior. This is a plate being bent by a, you know, a, a compression force, but in one case it's pinned, meaning perfectly hinged, and the middle case it's partly hinged, and then the lower it's, it's fixed at each end. Now what we can see is the the tension affects the shape that the, that the beam attains. And um, what happens is it's, um, we have, we have um, areas of greater bending and areas of less bending. And this is gonna affect the wave speed through the material. And so um, things like um, mode spacing, I would imagine, and mode shape, um, something's gonna be changed by that. So when we put, um, forces on a violin is going to deform in very complicated ways, making it again hard to come up with, making, making me at least question my intuitive, intuitive notions about what's going to happen. So measurements. Um, those who heard Jim's talk will already have been introduced to admittance where you tap the side of the bridge. In this case, I'm, I just stuck an accelerometer on it. It's, it works fine for this sort of thing. Um, what this measures is how much energy is going into the violin. Um, the radiation uh, measures um, 
how much sound is coming out. So we have the input and the output, and it's um, useful to compare those. Now, um, you can tap the bridge sideways. I, that, I, they call that horizontal, or um, just an H for short, and vertically. Um, Jim mentioned that again. Um, or you can do both and average them, which I quite often do for radiation. So um, again, just to um, um, review the, the features, we have the signature modes down here, A0, the B1 modes, the transition hill, bridge hill, that's one of the uh, principal formants. Um, typically, amplitude is in dB and log frequency. And here's a typical violin. Um, now, this is um, that same violin with admittance. And we can see right away that they don't track each other that well. I mean, we have peaks in the same places frequency-wise, but there's some, um, there's some modes. Here, I've smoothed it out. There's some um, areas where the admittance is much lower than the radiation, where, in other words, putting little energy into it causes a lot to come out. So we call that efficient, an efficient radiator. We see that here. Um, there's the opposite case where um, you're putting a lot of energy into the violin and very little is coming out. Um, here again, it's very efficient. Here, less so. So um, I'll be circling back to this concept a little later on. So um, what, I, what I've done, the, the, the basic simple ex ex experiment is um, take a violin measure it with, with it tuned up, then simply loosen the DNA string and measure it again. I left the a little bit of attention on the string so they're not flapping around. And also because then their effective mass is, is still applicable. So that's not another variable. Um, and I took the middle strings because my sense was if we leave some tension on the sound post and balance that on the base of our side, not too, you know, the, not too much else is gonna happen in terms of shape change. Hopefully, um, I do know that loosening the all the tension, except for let's say the G string, you know, your your um, well can drastically up alter the sound because the sound post will become loose. So um, what do we see here? So the red is with the loose strings, the black is for the full tension. This will be throughout the talk that way, and we actually see um, some change. We see um, a little bit more. Um, um, oh, excuse me. Um, a little bit. We, we have a little net gain across the frequencies up to about three kilohertz, and a, um, still a little bit above here. We also um, this is looking at it a, a band average of the whole range. So in all, there's a, just about a third of a dB increase. We also see a, um, a change in the spectral balance. Spectral centroid is sort of the center of balance of low versus high. Um, it's also a, a definition of brightness in, in, in psychoacoustics. So the lower the central spectroid, the darker the sound. In this case, it's just 53 hertz. That said, spectral centroid doesn't vary that much across a wide range of violins. I mean, 100 is a big difference. Um, 200, I don't remember the exact amount um, from, a, the, from the big population, but um, we see a small effect, but it, it is, um, we'll, we'll see very consistent. So here's another single violin. Um, we have increase here about, about the same amount in the transition hill, a little tiny bit increase in the bridge hill and a loss in the upper upper section. Um, I'm sorry, I got a little lost here. Okay, so. Okay, so. This is this is the second violin. Um, what we do see is maybe a little bit of a frequency shift, but um, this is radiation, so you shouldn't trust the mode peaks to be the mode frequencies because there's often contributions from other modes. Um, but there's a suggestion of it here. But there's, I, I think, a little more of a suggestion of it here, and we can tell a little better when we get to um, admittance measurements. But the first thing that struck me about this is nothing much is happening in terms of, of frequency to, uh, and that, true, that seemed true to a very um, surprising degree to me. I would have thought we would have um, seen a change, but apparently not. Um, 
Okay, the second one, there's a, a very slight loss in um, overall output, but that's within not, um, that could be measurement error. Um, but again, we have a spectral centroid drop and that's a little more than last time. Another violin. Um, here we see this effect around I think that's C4 mode, but otherwise frequencies are, this, are the same, a little bit of a gain at lower frequencies, a little bit of a drop at higher frequencies, a bit of a spectral drop. So this is tending to confirm the notion that things get a bit less bright with less tension. Um, another one, in this case, I think I'm seeing a, 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 a mode Something's happening there. A tiny bit of a loss overall, again, a drop in centroid frequency. So I've just averaged those five violins and um, what we see on average is a slight increase below three kilohertz, a slight decrease above. Um, I don't want to conclude too much from such a small population. And we see a, a, a drop in centroid of about 38 Hertz and overall slight gain in output. Now, um, let's look at the, um, let's look at admittance and radiation at the same time. So for each of these slides, this is a single violin. The top is um, radiation, the bottom is admittance. and um, in this case, the admittance is hardly affected. Um, the radiation is affected a little. Same thing again, a little more affected high frequencies. Same again. So there is, there is some independence, but not much. Um, so the conclusions, which are very tentative, the sample size is that it barely affects signature modes frequencies. Um, it, it, something may be going around on around C4, that's around six, seven hundred hertz. Um, there seems to be a bit of an increase in radiation um, that should be uh, below about three kilohertz and a little bit of a decrease above. And it may affect radiation efficiency. That's the difference between the two. But um, the, the most robust um, effect seems to be the um, the drop in spectral centroid. Um, but we should say that all these are, are fairly small effects considering we're taking the string tension down by almost a third. Um, so that my conclusion from this is the effect of putting a lighter or heavier sets of strings is, is, is very important for the player, but doesn't make a lot of difference for the instrument, at least within um, this small, um, Population. We could say if we had some very thin, flexible instruments, it would almost surely make a bigger difference. Um, but to me, this means you can put a bigger engine on these cars, and you know the frame's going to sort of um, hold hold its own. Um, now, if we let's look at brake angle. So, um, violin makers always talk about, often talk about it in terms of string angle, something like 158 degrees in typical. Um, I think break angle is looking at it this way, the smaller version. I like break angle because as it goes up, um, so does the, the downward force. And, um, and of course, it's the, the break angle is determined by the, the, uh, the height of the overstand, the height of the arching, the height of the bridge, and the height of the lower saddle. I know there's assumption here that the total, there, I'd say there's a assumption in the field that the total break angle is important. So if you raise your um, overstand, for example, you could decrease your saddle height and you'd get the same thing. But it's not at all clear to me that that is true. Um, I hope to test that in the future. And why might it not be true? Well, one of the big arguments about the importance of break angle has to do with how much of the longitudinal string vibration how much does that contribute to the, the, the total recipe? Um, um, as, as we know, when a string vibrates laterally, it's also going to be pulling the ends a little bit. And if the break angle were zero, that would have no effect on the, 
um, um, the bridge, but as the break angle gets higher, um, it, it would get bigger and bigger. Now, um, Nigel Harris has written quite passionately about this. And um, I think I, I'll stay away from that for now, but I think it is an area worth investigating. Um, but for now, all, all I'm gonna do is measure the change in um, break angle on the um, um, lower saddle end. So um, string tension directly affects the interaction of the bow and string. Break angle doesn't. I mean, there's no reason to think it does, um, except to the extent that it changes the body behavior, which we're going to look at now. Um, now, I think that um, um, so much research shows the importance of the bridge and the height of the bridge. And I think that's the dominant effect here. When we talk about um, changing the break angle, you're not going to change the arching. So what are you going to do? Um, you can change the lower side or you can change the bridge. And the bridge is always changing as it gets cut down. So I think there's some confusion in our intuitions about break angle, which is associating it with higher or lower bridges. The idea here is that we'll not, we'll ignore bridge height um, and we'll, we'll try and vary it independently of that. Um, David Burgess put this article in, um, make, make, making matters in the strat. It's a clever way of changing the, um, the break angle by sliding it up and down that pin and at the, the slant um, cleverly um, means it's not going to go much out of tune when you when you change it. Um, the saddle rider was a was an ingenious product developed by John Haynes Edson. I hope I'm pronouncing the name right, John, if you're here. Um, he's a he's a he's a very good cellist. He's an artist in residence, a senior lecturer at Cornell University, former member of the um, Philadelphia Orchestra, and he's got a real gift for mechanical design. And he designed this thing, which you can put into a violin. Um, and with a screw, you can change the saddle height um, by about a total of 10 millimeters. So it rests on top of the saddle. Um, so whatever your saddle height is, let's say three millimeters would be normal for me. You can add 10 to that. So you get about a total of 13. So that, that's, um, and thank you, John, for for sending me this one. That's what I've used for the measurements I do. Um, there's also an article recently in the Strad um, um, about, well, I'll read the blurb. Double bass repairs know the value of raising the saddle to help the instrument sound open up, but how much do you raise it? Felix Habel reveals the formula that can give exact measurement every time. Now, um, he proposes that the acoustical effects of varying saddle height and therefore break angle can be simulated by varying the string tension. I, I, it's not clear to me that that would be the case, but um, he lays it out so well, I think it'd be a lot of fun to do that experiment and, and see if, if, is, there some, is there some connection. Um, he also, um, well, he, so here's what he says to do, raise or lower the overall tuning of the bass until it plays best. I assume that's your client who's gonna tell you then calculate the change in overstand height that produces the same downward force on the bridge and then raise or lower the saddle accordingly. Um, and he, he has this calculator, which you can download as an Excel spreadsheet, which is actually very useful for all kinds of, um, you could put in the pitch of the strings, you can put in the um, string angle or the, um, you can put in the bridge height, um, belly, saddle, all that, and it'll, um, um, give you variations in the height of the raised saddle and, and the downward force scale factor. So it's a, it's a, a very nice um, calculator. Um, so again, um, string tension directly affects bow string interactions. Break angle doesn't. So I am skeptical about the, any equivalencies one would want to make there, but worth, worth exploring. So some beliefs about break angle just Googling around Roger Hargrave, this angle creates a downward pressure on the bridge that in turn will either generate or mute the instrument's sound. Um, so it's hard to unpack what that means. It, um, it's either gonna raise or lower the amplitude of the sound and maybe the brightness. And um, James McKean in, in Strings Magazine, the break angle determines the brightness and power. A lower angle will give you a mellow, mellower, more open sound. Well, um, let's see what it does to the measurements. Um, I, I was trying to lift a, 
20 pound weight the other day. And I realized that's about the downward force on a violin. And I, I just couldn't imagine applying that much force. But of course we do that every time we string up a violin. Um, it's just one of the things about a violin. It's like those photos of a car being lowered onto four eggs and, <laughs> and managing not to break them. So um, um, Lonnie Marino, one of my assistants, I asked her to put together this kind of graphic calculator to show, um, 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 to, to sort of show what happens when we change the various parameters. So break angle, I just measure at the D string. You can't really measure it. Well, you could measure it at the top of the bridge if you made a kind of a long protractor thing that went all the way to the, um, to the upper saddle. Um, but I just measured at the D string. So and the overstand and saddle height, I measured from the top surface of the edge. So um, it might be six. Well, let me show you some. So what I think of as a normal setup would be a six millimeter overstand, a 15 millimeter arch, a 32 millimeter bridge, and a three millimeter saddle. And that'll give you 100 degrees and a downward force of almost 20 pounds or 8.8. .8 kilograms. <clears throat> Oops, I got in there again. Um, now, this is, I tried to imagine what's the highest you could possibly do. So the three millimeter overstand, a nine, 19 millimeter arch, a 34 millimeter bridge, and uh, no lower saddle just coming right off the top edge. And that's, that gives 27.6. So that's quite a bit higher and a downward force of about 11 kilograms or 24 pounds. So that's sub substantial about a good five pounds more. Um, now, what about extremely low break angle? Um, one of the things that got int me interested in this was an idea for making life a bit easier for players, especially in viola. If we push the overstand up a long way, it, it, I think it would be significantly easier to get around the instrument. Um, the lower it is, the more you have to, to reach around when you're in high positions. Um, if one did this, practically speaking, you want to make sure you reinforce this neck very securely, otherwise it would tend to, I would think, start flexing there. So imagine a 12 millimeter overstand, a 13 millimeter arch, a 30 millimeter bridge, and a six millimeter saddle, and that would drop the angle down to um, just about 18 degrees, and the downward force to about nearly 16 pounds or just over seven kilograms. So that's, that's quite a range. So that's just summarizing it increasing the break angle by 9.7 degrees, which is the total range, raises downward force by about 3.84 kilograms or 8.5 pounds. And that comes out to about 0.4 kilograms or, or about 0.9 pounds per degree. Um, so we are looking um, at about how much we can change the um, break angle through the lower saddle. Um, and because the um, saddle rider would give about a 10 millimeter range. That's what I'm going to be doing. And so raising it 10 millimeters decreases downward force by about 1.4 kilograms or 3.1 pounds. Um, and this is going the other way. Let's, let's ignore that. Um, okay, so a measurement. This is a single violin. The red indicates the high um, saddle. The black indicates the low saddle. So this is raising and lowering the, the saddle rider. And um, well, the first thing I notice is unlike with the um, string tension experiment, we, we do see something happening here. Um, I, 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 one thing it could be is we have this very different saddle that's kind of flapping around. Is it, are there some, um, um, not saddle, excuse me, tailpiece. Are there some tailpiece resonance that are interfering with this or, or, but then again, we see, well, let me show you the next one. So not modest, modest change at high frequencies. Now, this is looking at the admittance and I was quite surprised by this because if anything, for example, the output is, is gaining a little in the um, transition hill region, but we have quite a large drop in um, admittance. 
Um, and uh, at, on the other hand, it, it, um, it rises at the high frequency. So what I see here is even though the um, output doesn't change very much, you need less energy into it to get that output, which to me is, is fascinating. And I don't know any way of thinking about the instrument that explains it. And I'm hoping some of our experts can. Clearly a, a change of mode, mode shapes um, would be needed. Um, with, it, with this, with, with, with our um, admittance measurement, I'm a little more confident about frequency changes, but it's not so obvious here that this is going on. No, so I'm going to show them at the same time. So this is a single violin, um, not much change in radiation and some noticeable changes in admittance. Let's see what happens with other instruments. In this one, not much change um, in either in terms of amplitude, but look at this. This is to me clearly a, a frequency change. B1 plus is dropping in frequency. And that immediately says, well, this, this kind of adjustment could be useful in, in, in um, wolf control. Um, and um, so right away, it becomes interesting. Um, what else about this? Okay, and this was a, a, a Roth, uh, kind of a student violin. And again, the admittance, the, the radiation isn't changing very much, but the admittance is um, decreasing by, you know, we're talking about a decibel or so. So, and, and but it's going up in the highest region again. And again, I don't have a obvious explanation why this would be so, except that the saddle height seems to be con um, controlling the efficiency somewhat, meaning the, the higher the saddle, the more efficient the instrument is. Here's another one. This one, there's less pronounced effect. But the effect is slightly higher with radiation and slightly lower with, admit, with admittance. Again, this kind of slight an intriguing independence between them. Um, here, admittance is going up. Radiation, well, it's pretty much the same. Um, oh, yes. Um, there seems to be, mo um, this would be the um, C4 mode. This mode radiates more with um, vertical excitation. Um, so we're not seeing it, um, it's not very pronounced in this, but we do see, I think, a, a frequency change. And not convinced about it, other ones. So conclusions, raising the lower saddle by 10 millimeters does affect radiativity, but there's not an immediately obvious trend to me the way there, there seem to be with string tension with um, the spectral centroid dropping. Um, it does seem to affect the admittance more strongly at times, and that, that really seems to be worth further study. I, I, I would like to understand better the sort of things that could be happening that would explain that. And if any of you out there have ideas, I, 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 I look forward to hearing them. And there's some B1 um, plus mode frequency changes, and that could be useful for um, you know wolf notes. Um, so, but unlike the, the the string tension effects, which were fairly small. These seem to me they they are significant, um, and it would be great, like at Oberlin, to try this out and have players comment and do some blind tests. Can they tell um, if there's changes? All that sort of thing. Significant should always come in quotation marks. I think significant to who? What ends up being significant in a blind test uh, may, may have to may be a huge change. Where where what might be significant to a player um, it can be a lot smaller. Um, so um, that's about that's as far as I got with this talk. So um, we'll continue. Oh, one point I did want to make: if you have an effect where there's an, a, tr a trend, then it makes and the trend is a good one, then it makes sense to to build that trend into the instrument, so to speak. Um, with string tension, um, it would seem to be um, maybe a slightly darker 
um, but more sound output with lower tension. But we can't do much about that for the reasons Fan gave us. Players don't really want to uh, bear much from string tension. If, on the other hand, we have something that varies more from instrument to instrument, then my thought is let's try and put a knob on it so the player can adjust it. And a knob is exactly what um, John has provided us with. So um, thank you again, John. That's all I have for now. So um, thanks for listening and I will um, turn it over. All right. Thank you, Joseph. My pleasure. All right. Um, we have at least two questions in the queue. Um, Oh, it's interesting because on one screen, Andrew is ahead of Claudia, on the other screen, Claudia is ahead of Andrew. So. <laughs> Transatlantic. <laughs> I'm going to go with the visual screen. So, Claudia? Thanks, but actually, Andrew was before me. Oh, oh, oh yeah, because you're a co Okay. Andrew? So, I think, I suppose we'd have both time to uh, ask. Yeah, yeah. Well, why did you go, Claudia? We have time for uh, both of you. Yeah, so uh, thanks, Joseph. I wanted to know, uh, it would have been nice to compare your results with some like reproducibility measurements, you know, uh, what happens when you do the same experiment, you lower the saddle and you put it up again, and you know, what happens when you do it on a different day. And it's just because to me, even what you call significant, it's within one dB. And from having done some of these measurements, I feel that one dB is really within the range of reproducibility. But maybe I, you were very good in terms of reproducibility and it's much smaller for in your, with your setup. I don't know. So that's well, the question. Well, it, it is a good question. And, and if this was an official paper, not a preliminary investigation, I would put some reproducibility results in error bars. Um, I do agree with you, of course. I do feel, um, for example, you have an accelerometer attached, you have the hammer there, you can, reduce the middle strings tension and measure it again right away and get and then put it back again and you get almost identical results. Um, and the same with the, um, the saddle rider. I didn't go back and forth, but I've done enough measurements that I'm pretty confident about a decibel change. I'd say a quarter dB in a, in a, in a band average is I, I start to worry. But when you um, when you get some um, um, five instruments doing more or less the same thing as they were with the string tension, and then the average, and then the average come out the same, I'd say there's a good chance that if we did a bigger experiment with a, a lot more, we'd, mm -hmm. we'd get the same results. With so the, you were able, you were able, able to keep the violin in place without moving. The oh yes. Hammer yeah. and, okay. For, for for the string tension, yes, but for the saddle rider, no. Um, yeah. But I did one of them twice and it was pretty much the same. That said, for something that doesn't show a trend and it seems to be a, a significant difference, again, um, um, quotations around that, um, I would want to do that with maybe a, a, um, a, better, a better way of doing it um, or It'd be hard. You spend a lot of time designing equipment to do it. <laughs> I mean, ideally, we could change if there was some sort of a imagine some sort of a lever switch that it would immediately change the saddle height while keeping the strings in tune. It's possible. I mean, it, it takes some a bit of clever engineering, but then we could do blind tests and hand it back and forth. Um, so if it's an interesting enough question, um, it'd be worth doing it. Thanks. All right, Andrew. Hi there. Uh, sorry about the pic no picture. Um, I think uh, Harris wrote a little bit about this stuff a, a while ago, um, and I don't know whether it applies or whether you agree with it. Um, he seemed to think that the, the break angle had to do with um, the, the, the stiffness of the string or that as the string is displaced, its tension goes up. As you bow a string, the tension rises. Um, and that principally is in the upper partials. Um, and the break angle is the thing that is most sensitive to that. So it's a vertical force. So um, that 
change in tension, um, the thing that's most sensitive is the break angle. Uh, at least that was his claim. So um, that would make sense with, I think with your observation, Joe, that the C4 seemed to be the most pronounced change, the mode that changed the most, which was is a vertical, a, a mode that's very sensitive to the vertical force change. Um, so for instance, if you, if you have a very flat, if you have a low break angle, the, the, the tra transverse modes are not really changed that much. It's as you increase the break angle, this sensitivity to the tension of the string, the, the change in the string's tension due to its inelasticity. Um, the, am I making sense of his, what he, what he claimed? Does that does it make, make sense? Well, I, I find his work very hard to understand, um, right. partly because he's mixing sort of modern modal thinking with Renaissance architecture ideas. <laughs> and and it, 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 I just find it very difficult. Right. As I understand it, um, um, we did some beautiful measurements of how a violin distorts I mean, physically with you know, just precise measurements. So, um, I, in the second right. half of this talk, whenever I get to it, I, I hope to take on some of these ideas. So the two things, um, the break angle only on the front of the bridge, is it gonna change the amount of longitudinal string vibration that can contribute? I don't think it makes any difference on the back. And I think that needs to be distinguished because one is controlled by the overstand and the other by the saddle. Um, secondly, the direct, what do you think he calls the direct longitudinal force? Again, he has these, the transverse, there's a TSD and an LTD, I, I don't remember, um, but basically, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I get confused even thinking about it. The, the, the longitudinal string vibration, he admits, makes an only a very small direct effect. And I think that physicists would agree with that. What he is saying is that the longitudinal string vibration also pulls the saddle back and forth. Um, and that excites the rest of the instrument. And, um, and that's certainly true. How important is that? Right. I think the easiest way to get at that is to simply measure, um, I think the, what would be, imagine you tap the bridge sideways, but you measure velocity vertically. You could then measure in a straightforward way the, how much of the horizontal um, vibration turns itself into vertical and, and, and I hope Jim, if you're around, correct me if I'm wrong there. Um, there'd be also some interesting ways to test the contribution. One that I've just got all the stuff for, but haven't done yet is to do a wire break test. Imagine a thin wire attached to the tailpiece going over the bridge into the peg box, um, tightening it up until it breaks. It seems to me that the only contribution that would make would be this um, longitudinal string vibration and then record that and then do the same thing, pulling the bridge sideways. So I, I, I hope to get to that and that'd be a fun thing to do at Oberlin. Right. I don't know whether I've answered your question, but I'm, I'm confused about his words. Um, yeah, I mean, I, 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 I guess the, the model I'm trying to picture in my, in my head is that if the, if the break angle is increasing, um, is that, that more, may, does that make, the changes in the elasticity of the string as it's being played is is it is it exponential? Is the change in the in the restorative force of the string vertically exponential or linear? I guess that's the the question. And he, I would assume, he's saying that it's exponential as you as you increase the break angle, that it is um, somehow more sensitive than the linear horizontal force. That seems, um, that's how I understood his model. And I don't know whether that's. Well, maybe maybe Jim could pipe in here, but, but um, let, I should say though, that the measuring I'm doing, the strings are damp. So these sort of things aren't really coming to play. Although it made right. me wonder, um, although a piece of paper nicely damps um, sideways string motion, I doubt it has, much effect on longitudinal, but again, that's something that would be worth looking at right. it himself. But Jim, are, are you around? Could you add anything to this? I also find Nigel Harris's stuff a little misleading and I've 
done lots of work with him and I still don't quite I mean, the most recent thing of his I read he seems to have changed his mind so yes I'm not clear about that um the only definite thing I can say, which doesn't answer your question in the least, but um, in the banjo study, these effects are important. And that low frequency formant I'm talking about is determined to a large degree by the by the stiffness and the tension of the strings. The break angle is is the dominating factor. So I think this is talked about a lot in the violin and is probably a small effect. That's my summary of your talk. <laughs> the, the, but it, it could, it, it's not intrinsically a trivial thing. And in the banjo, it really seems to matter. And actually, if people find David Politzer's web thing, he did a very neat experiment where he designed a cunning tailpiece and bridge so that he could actually switch the same instrument between regular break angle and zero break angle. You have to have a bridge that the strings threaded through so that it didn't fall down when the um, and he's got sound recordings of that and that very strikingly different. And that makes sense with the study we did. So um, it, the effect certainly can happen. And it's probably there to a small extent in a similar way on the violin, but but much smaller. But yes, a good, keep Thank keep you. up the good work. Keep trying. Yes. <laughs> Can you say what was the difference in the response with the strings that did not push down on the top of the violin? I'd be very curious about that. Uh, I'm I'm sorry. Um, were you asking Jim? Hey, Ned. Were you asking Jim that? Yeah, who was ever just just there, or you know, yeah, yeah, well, in, throughout the discussion, I was just curious. I'm very curious about this topic. So, you yeah, said that in, you in, actually made a violin with no down I mean, pressure on it, and it, I'm it, very it, curious. It was a banjo. It, it was in a. Oh, it, this was banjo. a banjo experiment, and um, and so it's there's no direct comparison, but the effect is very striking. The sound files are on on his website. You can listen to them, and it doesn't matter whether you like the sound of the banjo or not. The difference is very striking that there's a real effect there and maybe we understand that well i believe so, it and did yeah. he glue the bridge down then to the to the skin he must have no, glued it to I'd, the I, yeah. you're screwed i i'd have to uh, he was here earlier but i think he may have gone i can't remember is the answer to that but it's uh, i'd have to read his thing again but he's, he's teaching a class make, right now <laughs> yeah i think he had to go to teach a class but it's it's worth um he's got pictures and I think if you search on Pulitzer banjo, <laughs> you'll, you'll um, you, you, you could track down this post, and it's um, I say it's off to one side of violin questions, but it proves that these things can be important in real stringed instruments, but just different ones. Okay, we we have to start wrapping it up. We we got a dispensation to go over it just a tiny bit, but um, so let's move on to John. Hi, everyone. I, I'm not sure if you can hear me. I apologize. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, great. Uh, I apologize for no picture. Verizon chose today to shut down all my data and phone privileges. So I'm <laughs> doing the best I can here. Uh, there was a, they're working on a tower. Anyway, um, so I'm the guy responsible for this uh, saddle rider folly. Um, and I will say um, it is as confounding to me as anyone who will test it, I'm sure. Um, I just a little background. I am a you know a professional cellist. That's my day job, and I teach at Cornell. And I am very very aware of the pitfalls of psychoacoustics and thinking you hear things that you don't, and you know sampling tap water and tasting all kinds of things. So I'm very aware of that, and and I teach my students to listen very critically to what they think they hear. Um, so you know I'm always suspicious of what I think I hear and try to find ways of of you know blind testing myself and fooling myself but what i find with this um with this break angle situation is you know i i wanted the tool for my cello i leave it on my cello all the time it's very inconspicuous and weeks will go by even months where i don't touch it, it and and sometimes if i will do a test it is a, it is definitely there are subtle changes um the, the changes are quite i think obvious to any professional musician if you go from one extreme to the other and there's sort of a what would be considered a, a sweet spot somewhere in the middle that's a range where things tend to work the best 
But that being said, it is a very subtle change in certain weather patterns, certain, you know, sometimes it's, it's pretty hard to hear. Um, and in some acoustical environments, it's pretty hard to hear. At the same time, when a very different phenomenon can happen where, um, you know, suddenly the feeling of the bottom dropping out of the instrument because of the weather pattern or traveling, and then suddenly a, a relatively small change will make a striking difference, one that's readily apparent to most discerning listeners. Um, one of the things that I, I've been working on, you know, I, for some reason I found that gut strings in the last month I spent about a thousand dollars trying many different gauges of gut strings for a project I'm working on with early keyboards. And interestingly, I found that this break angle seems to make a much greater difference in smaller degrees with gut strings, perhaps because of the more sensitivity to higher frequencies. I, I'm not sure why, but it's, but it's a much more sensitive um, response with uh, especially lower tension gut strings, but gut strings in general. Um, this brings me to one final question about the testing mechanism itself. One thing that was very interesting, and I'd love to hear comments on this, I know we don't have time now, but uh, is that, uh, Joseph, if I understood correctly, you know, that the tension of the string, you said, if I understood you correctly, that that makes a big difference to the player, but in terms of measuring, you know, radiation admit admit admittance on the instrument itself, th these changes are not so apparent between different string tensions, but they're very apparent to the interaction between the player and the instrument. Now, uh, <laughs> I didn't spend a thousand dollars for my health. You know, the, the difference between these subtle gauges of gut strings is striking in the sound. And, and so then it, it brings up a question as a player with my suspicion of the testing mechanism. If there are such critical, um, critically audible differences as between different strings with fans and didario strings and, you know the players are so attuned to this and it makes such an obvious difference not just to the player but the listener in the hall and yet this difference between strings is not something that shows up so obviously when being measured using the 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 impact uh you know force sensing hammer accelerometer and, and this sort of thing you know it just makes me wonder it seems like they're real blind spots, perhaps, in the testing mechanism well, itself. Oh, I don't mean to yeah, stop Joseph, right, explain. Stop right, stop okay. right there. <laughs> That's okay. a, it's exactly why we do measure it this way, is those variables aren't part of it. It's as simple as that. Yeah, Joseph's setup doesn't really measure the it doesn't measure the strings. Okay, because we want to take the string variable out. So he's just trying to measure are there differences caused by the tensions to the behavior of the instrument body the corpus yes. bridge so yeah oh. this is very important question it, it, and your your comment reflects i think a general confusion or a difficulty intuitively in, of separating the two there's the very vivid effect to the player of these um of strings and changing the tension and changing the quality of strings and then there's what the violin does in reaction to that which is impossible to get at <laughs> from playing. You have to measure the instrument. Um, so um, um, you're, you're, you're quite correct, but it, it, it's not contradicting anything I'm doing. They're two, they're two quite separate categories. Now, um, I will say though that these very strong impressions of players, what Claudia and I have found with a lot of our blind tests is generally speaking, players have very strong opinions about a given instrument set up, but they disagree. <laughs> even to the point of contradiction, which is best, whereas listeners have smaller impressions, but they agree more. So there's um, what's important to the player, his, his or her impressions are important to the audience, their impressions are important. So one of the things that re research can do, I hope, is to show which of these translate. So you can put your own impressions. Um, um, you can also bring the listener's impressions um, into the into the factor. I mean, this is very important with things like projection. You may love playing a certain kind of string, but listeners may say, "Well, we don't hear you." Um, and and um, anyway, enough said. Yeah. Thank you so much. That uh, I, I understand completely, and I am most interested in my research in those more subtle differences, but the more consistent responses that the audience gets from 
what I'm doing and what my students are doing. And so that is very interesting, but I, I still hope to find more uh, consistent testing methods in addition to the hammer method that, that can measure the interaction between the player and the instrument. I understand it's perhaps a fool's errand, but it's my well, class. <laughs> oh, I don't think so. I think that Claudia and in her lab, they're doing all sorts of things in that direction. I, I remember a fascinating experiment where, where I think it was a cellist, correct me if I'm wrong, Claudia was judging a cello and then doing the same thing, ears plugged completely and came up with the same answers. And how on earth is that possible? Well, you know, there's a lot we don't understand about the interactions and that's a fascinating area of research, but it's not really physics or acoustics so much as, as an interaction between acoustics, psychoacoustics, ergonomics, psychology, all, all of these things. Mm -hmm. But that's, I mean, that's the world where, where artists live. So, so we, we should be studying it. So let's, um, jo George, let's move on to George and let's, um, you know, one final question from George and then we're gonna have to end this. Uh, I'll make it very quick, but I would just like to tag on to the end of that one that I, I, I often say that, um, sound and playing qualities are, are best assessed by listening and playing. So there's nothing, uh, just because something isn't susceptible to measurement with the tools that we have, doesn't mean to say those aren't effects that people observe. So carry on doing it, L listen and experiment. And, and if there's a very good consensus of opinion, then take it as something worth following. But just back to the, uh, these kind of tensions and things again, it was actually around about the time that all this Nigel Harris stuff started. I, I did some ex experiments where I detuned a violin and, and did the modal analysis at various levels of tension. And uh, one of the things that came out of it is, is that the modes that are affected most are things like B1 plus. And the, the reason I think is quite simple is because of the corpus bending and the neck moving with it is that you actually get a change of string length. So, uh, but the, um, the elastic, the stiffness of the string doesn't really change with tension. So to mean, so the, it's actually the elastic modulus of the string is contributing to the overall stiffness of the instrument. And, and that is, uh, it's, it's an effect uh, and, uh, and like so many of these other things is there, but it's not a massive one. Okay, so did you find that the mode, mode frequencies changed? Yes, I, I saw a bit more shift in mode frequencies than you did, but then I probably went through a, a larger degree of change in tension. So if I just tune the strings down a little bit, nothing really happens. Because I think that is because, uh, this was discussed this with Jim, and this is what we came up with, is that it's actually the, the effect is the elastic modulus of the string itself, which isn't, isn't dependent on tension, it's dependent on enough tension being present to keep keep any backlash out of the system or hysteresis. So 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 George, in that in that case you should be able to use two completely different strings, steel core string and a highly elastic, whatever, gut string or whatever, of the even of the same tension and see different effects. Uh, uh, I think theoretically yes. So you can if make me a silicone string that's very stretchy. Uh -huh. So, so George, what was the total change in frequency of, let's say, the B B one plus? Well, uh, uh, I, I don't remember exactly, but a few hertz, something is clear enough oh, in the middle. A few hertz, okay. Yeah, so but very, it's, very but it's small. not across all modes. You see, you, you don't get all modes shifting. You get ones that uh, uh, that are affected by the elastic modulus of the string, and some modes are, are not, like CVR, for example. You wouldn't expect that uh, have much effect. Anyway, it was just a little, a little observation. Well, fascinating. Yeah. All right. So I think we, should, we need to end this because there's another program starting. They agreed to hold it off for a couple of minutes, but I think they've already started, I suspect. So thank you, everyone, for attending. Thank you to our speakers, Jim and Joseph, for the wonderful presentation. And, and I hope to see all of you in our next um, first Friday, first Friday in December, set up for sound. And they're with Sam Zygmuntovich, Robin Aitchison, and Andrew Ryan. And there you will have almost all the time in the world afterwards to ask questions or discuss any topic you want. All right. Bye-bye. Thank you.